Welcome to the Pure Passion Podcast with Dr. David Kyle Foster. This podcast and our many other resources are made possible by our donors. Please support this ministry by going to our website, masteringlife.org. Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm David Kyle Foster. Today we have a wonderful guest who we've had on before, but she's got so much to say and so much interesting things on such a vital topic that we've had her back for the third time. Her name is Ann Polk. And she is the executive director of Restored Hope Network in Colorado Springs that has branches all over the country, even a few in other countries, uh, from what I understand. Is that right? Well, we have friends in other countries, but not branches. Yeah. Okay. You've got friends in all the right places, maybe. That's right. (laughs) And above all governments, actually. That's right. (laughs) So there. So um, if you go to the RestoredHopeNetwork.org, website, uh, you will see a film that we're sort of taking off on today. It's called How Do You Like Me Now? When a spouse, parent, sibling, or uh, somebody else, a brother or sister sibling, uh, says they're gay. And the whole film is about what do you do when somebody says they're gay? Perhaps they're your child or just a friend. Um, there's not a lot of information on that, so I highly recommend you go watch that. So we're taking up that topic today to get Anne's perspective from how many years in ministry in this area? Holy smoke. <laughs> uh, more than three decades. How's that? Okay. That's probably good more enough. Three decades. Well, I'm hitting 40 years in ministry, and um, so 34 for, for the ministry I started, but 40 okay. for me personally. Yeah, I think it's it's upward of 35 years for me. So wisdom so like you could only hope for is here today. <laughs> so let's get to it because uh, we have a list of things that Anne recommends that you do if you're in a situation where a friend or loved one says they're gay. And I think the first one is the most important one. How do you prepare yourself spiritually? Well, I really think it's so important to... Uh, read up on the word, but also put in your mindset, in your mind, uh, that the person who is coming with an LGBTQ uh, identity comes from a different worldview. And so it's kind of getting ready to uh, speak elements of God's truth to them, but pray up and have your spiritual um, battlement, your, you know, the helmet of salvation the belt of truth and all the rest that Mm -hmm. ephesians 6 recommend put that on um be ready to um you know preparation of the gospel of peace that's a powerful weapon Um, and pray Uh, really important to pray before speaking because we can say things that can stick in someone's mind for an awful long time especially if unfortunately there's something that offend a person unnecessarily i mean you know the hard word from a parent to a child or a spouse to another spouse or a friend to a friend can sometimes be very difficult to undo. And so it's really important to put on the mindset of Jesus and the heart of God before going into a conversation, Um, knowing that someone who's LGBTQ identified starts with an element of uh, hyper sensing of rejection and uh, judgment. And so they're expecting, they may feel personal rejection already in general or shame. Um, and so shame isn't always a good thing. Shame, shame meaning you feel that you are a bad person as opposed to uh, that you've done something wrong. That's the mm-hmm. difference um, uh, that we'd wanna avoid. You don't want to provoke them into going further in the direction they're going, but actually woo them with the love of Jesus. And so the important part is to pray first and be ready personally. Um, And that's really important because we're talking about spiritual warfare here in a situation where the media, the gay activists in the media for the last 50 years have been telling everybody that you and I hate homosexuals. So that's really the first order of business, isn't it, to express love, love to them. Yes, and disagreement is not hate, and yet that's what's become the norm of belief system in the U.S. 
What is the difference between feelings and identity? As you're talking to someone, that's another thing you're looking for, right? That is really important. I think uh, most of the millennials and Gen Zs and probably Generation Alpha that's coming up are currently a little bit, they have that a bit mangled right now. What is reality? What is truth? Is really a core difference with previous generations. Um, I would say having had been a lesbian myself, I would have called myself a lesbian or a lesbian Christian for a very brief time before I actually encountered God. And then I discarded the lesbian aspect and wanted to learn how to walk in, in the middle of uh, God's plan for me and walk out health and healing in my relationships. So, but these folks, the current culture has really been told that people are born gay, they believe it, and that gay is an inherent part of who they are, um, that that is who they are, that that is no, not distinguished from the human person. Uh, and so when you say the old 20, uh, 15 years ago person, a Christian might say, well, love the sin or hate the sin. But when you apply that to the topic of homosexuality, what the individual hears is I reject you because they identify as the sin mm. of homosexuality, of gay. So I would highly recommend that parents, especially of young people, um, and millennials, they'd evaluate their thinking, all generations actually, evaluate their thinking and decide, am I identifying myself as my feelings or something more important than that that's less movable? I'd recommend people actually have feelings, but they are a woman, a man, a son, a daughter, uh, an aunt, a niece, a Christian, those things are not changing based upon one's feelings for the day. They're concrete. Um, so I, they've really come to a point where who I am based on feelings is so changeable right now that um, a friend of mine up in Washington State asked um, Washington State University students, I think it was Washington University, actually, University of Washington students, uh, can I be a 5'9 white guy? Can I be a woman? And they said, oh, no problem. You know, we'd accept what if you say you're a woman. Well, can I be Chinese? Um, well, you may have some Chinese DNA in you, so maybe you're identifying with that part. Um, can I be six foot five? Um, and that's where the students had trouble. They didn't have trouble with identifying a person by something other than a 5'9 white guy saying he's, you know, Chinese and a female. No problem. But the 5'9 was the stumbling point for them. And that's a measurable mathematics equation. They're like, uh -huh, well, I think that's kind of stretching it. So we've come into a time in history where truth is is what you feel. And, and that's just off because it can, a, an adult can feel like they're a cat and they get cosmetic surgery to have whiskers implanted and people have no basis on which to say um, that person is a cat or is not a cat. Um, there's someone who thought they were a dragon. So they got cosmetic and tattoo surgery to look like that. Even more to the point that there are pedophiles who claim that they feel this way, they're born this way, and therefore what they're doing in terms of molesting children is legitimate. Right. That's right. And so what rights do the, does the child have? Of mm. course, they have plenty of rights currently, but will that continue? Um, minor attracted persons is the new term or they're trying to bring down the, the negative associations of the word pedophile, for example. Yeah. Um, those are problems. And so truth matters. Truth connected to material reality matters. Um, it's measurable whether somebody is actually uh, what race. You can check that with the DNA and the history and the, I mean, now we have all those DNA companies that will test your DNA, but um, whether you're female or male, I mean, that is a big challenge in our culture. What is accurate is saying someone feels that they may, that they that person feels that they're a cat. That mm -hmm. doesn't make them a cat. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that person feels that they're a woman, but they're actually biologically male. Yeah. We need to distinguish between feelings and identity. And what the gay world has done is they've taken their feelings and called called them their identity, which, as you point out, is nonsensical. It's a very weak basis for identity. And as a Christian, we have so much more to base our identity upon, son or daughter of the king, et cetera, et cetera. Well, those are all great things, but we're talking about an LGBTQ loved one who may not be a believer. Mm -hmm. So what I'd highly recommend is talking to your children, even as they're growing up, of people have feelings but they are a, and then give a concrete answer to that, to that comment, whatever is actually accurate. A Another problem is an feelings lie to you. Feelings can lie and people are often self-deceived. We, you know, remember the cult activity where they had the um, comet flying through past LA and a whole bunch of people drank uh, poison in order to join the comet up in the sky. A mm. lot of those folks had PhDs. Mm -hmm. They bought into this philosophy, these lies, and took their lives to follow this one guy who took them down a cult-like path, right? We can be deceived. So staying with concrete reality is so important. Um, do keep in mind, folks, that if you have a child who's identifying as opposite sex, that, and notice how I phrase that they're identifying as the opposite sex. I'm not saying they are the opposite sex. So there's some language that is truthful that you can use that is honoring and yet it is keeping what is true, true in front of the you know, truth right in front of their eyes at the same time. So it leaves room for truth to grow. It's almost People like- have feelings, they are something else, yeah. It's almost like uh, what happens with somebody who's trying to commit suicide. What you do is you try to take them back to reality by talking about concrete things that they can focus on rather than the feelings that are, that are lying to them. Let's go on to the next one. You said, uh, talk to the person about what works and what doesn't work in their life, and then ask them if you can pray for those things that aren't working. That's pretty, that's pretty good advice. Well, thank you, David. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times I have a couple people in my life who are gay identified. And there have been times when, depending upon relationship, I can ask these questions of how's that, how's that going? How's your relationship going? And just kind of get behind the scenes. Is that working? Is it not working? Yeah. Okay. So you're going to the bar scenes. Does that make you feel loved? Oh, really? What, what is it the attention or is it the, uh, are you getting the well that's in within all of us, the God-shaped hole that we're trying to cram other things into? Is that really working to fill those needs? Um, everybody needs to feel loved, cared for, and valued. Um, and, you know, whatever is bitter will taste sweet to the person who's starving, right? So that's the trick and that's the point. That's actually a scripture in Proverbs, even to the hungry, even what's bitter tastes sweet. And so that's the point. There's an emotional craving for connection, for value, feeling valued, for feeling loved. Um, and a lot of times gay relationships cannot and often don't and end up uh, hurting the individual more than they were even hurt to start with. So there is uh, you know, abuse in, in gay relationships and lesbian relationships. There's a discounting of one another. There's cheating on one another. There's a whole bunch of hosts of things going on in relationships. I'm not saying all of them are exactly like that. I'm saying it is not uncommon. No, um, it's not at all. And so it's important to ask how, how are you to their loved one? How are you? How are things really going? And let them and see the compassion that's in, let them see it in your eyes and feel it in your voice, right? That's right. That's right. And really listen well before offering to pray or anything. Listen well. I know that's a big challenge for parents whose loved ones, a son or daughter has just come out to them. And if that's not in your wheelhouse right now, don't worry. Just don't, don't step through that door because if, if it provokes your anger or your 
you just want to push off your child, then it's not really going to work to bond you to your child. So it's a matter of a person being ready for that. It's way easier to do that in an environment where there's a sibling or um, a different kind of relationship. But do keep in mind that as you grow and as you find security and comfort in the Lord, you may be ready to have some of those kind of conversations with your loved one and mm -hmm. being praying for them behind the scenes so that they can seek the real what really does fill up the God-shaped hole from the one who's able to fill it. Another thing you mentioned is that, uh, and I agree with this so much, there's so many people in the world today who disrespect the homosexual because they disagree with their lifestyle and they're angry that they're manipulating the culture. And so they approach the gay person without any respect. And that sort of cuts off the conversation from the start, doesn't it? It does, it really does. I mean, I've been served in restaurants and I have served people who are gay, lesbian, transgender. And what I try and do is look past how the person's presenting to see that there is a person that God loves and wants relationship with yeah. and who is precious right in front of me. Yeah. And so I start there. People are precious and that they matter to God and they matter to me. Um, so know that this person whom you're talking to is is immortal. They're going to live forever in one place or another. Well, let's make sure they have the best chance possible and not push them further away from God, but draw them near to him so they might have eternal life and a right relationship with the God of the universe. So I'm, I honestly, there was somebody who interviewed me in Minneapolis who presented as binary, a non-binary, um, did not identify whether the person was female or male. Um, to me, it appeared that it was a female by body structure who this person was a female who was presenting as non-male or female, right? And so that was an interesting interview. I wanted to be genuine. I wanted her to know that she mattered, that this person mattered, and that God cares about. And so I had a wonderful little conversation. I could tell there was some hostility coming at me from her. Uh, but I just applied kindness and mercy and love and um, related to her so that she would have the best opportunity to hear God's heart flowing through me. And so I think that that's my perspective is I want, whether it's a male or female, um, all the things you can try and stuff in that God-shaped hole will not satisfy until you meet the one who it was made for. Um, and, and everybody's kind of desolate until then and trying even greater things to throw in there, right? I mean, may let's it be talk, that we open up the door for them. Let's talk about relatives because this is a particularly difficult situation because the parent or the brother or sister or the spouse is invested heavily and emotionally in that relationship. And so you know, their spouse might, you know, charge them with all being hateful and, and not caring. And if you, if you don't accept me the way I am, I'm going to leave you. Talk about that whole milieu and what to do in situations like that. When, when do you know to pull back and talk about it later and so forth? Right. I would think it matters. Well, first, um, keeping, that's why you need to pray first <laughs> to be ready in case something like that happens. It is not uncommon for youth who identify as LGBTQ right now, one of those letters or one of the others that attach itself to demand that a parent or loved one accept and embrace and applaud their identity that they've come up with. And too bad if you have other feelings, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's important here is the one who knows Jesus, the one who's born again, the one who is filled with the Holy Spirit needs to be an example of the heart of God to this person and not sacrifice their beliefs at the same time. You don't have to lead out on those beliefs all the time. Um, you can, with grace and peace, be able to interact with your loved one and say, well, I love you as you are. I just, I believe that God has more for you. I've heard parents say that plenty of times. And I, I think it just goes right past all the boundaries a person sets up and says, you must say this or, um, or you must attend a gay wedding 
um, or I'm going to cut you out of my life. Sometimes those are empty threats. Sometimes they're not. Um, and so a parent really has to, or a loved one has to weigh, am I willing to sacrifice the relationship should it come to that, even though I adore and love my child or my loved one, um, but I disagree and I feel like I'm forsaking God's truth in the middle of it. We actually have some articles on that on our website um, in the newsletter, one of the first newsletters on the Restored Hope website restoredhopenetwork.org. So check it out, folks. Um, Rob Gagnon wrote a wonderful article about that. Um, so we could talk about gay weddings, but I think the other thing is if the person's yelling at you, disrespecting you, being hateful towards you, it's okay to say, hey, we'll talk about, I'd like to talk with, the, with you about this another time, but uh, under the current conditions, this is just not this is not, you're not respecting me and a difference of opinion. Um, I, I need you to show respect back towards me as well um, with a very calm voice and set up a little boundary there and say, I would love to talk with you, but not when you're shouting at me, um, that kind of thing. So it's totally okay to take care of yourself and not be stepped on like a mat. That's not okay. It's almost like the parable of the prodigal son where the father just had to let the son go because nothing was getting through to him. And he knew that the son had to reap the consequences of his behavior before he'd be willing to come back. Exactly. Perfect example, David. Yeah. It is a really tough thing to do, though, uh, especially for parent to child. I mean, really, you gave birth to this little one, you, you changed diapers, you fed this little one when they couldn't do anything for themselves, you helped them walk or ride a bike or learn to drive a car, um, how to have relationships and talk to one another. And now all of a sudden this thing pops up and um, the demands are enormous and the rejection toward the parent can be quite enormous. What highly, about the highly, gay marriage? highly recommend a parent not reject their child, not say, well, because you've embraced this identity, I can't have a relationship. That's a very damaging thing to do. And, and um, it's really important to maintain relationship. You can't have influence if you don't have a relationship. So gay marriage, you said, but do you want to say anything? Yeah, the, about that? It's often that a gay person will say, you've got to come to my wedding or you don't love me and I'm never right. going to talk to you again. What is a parent to do? And, and if they don't go to the marriage, should they go to the reception? All of that. Wow. That's, it is a really difficult question. There are a whole bunch of different viewpoints on this. Um, I, I know of people who went to their child's gay wedding, um, but I have a problem with that. And here's why. Because when you go to a wedding, you're actually standing there, you're hearing an agreement that you are standing as a witness or being there as a witness before God and man about this union that you're in disagreement with. In the old days, even in a heterosexual marriage, they used to have a time where they'd say, if anybody you know, disagrees with this, speak now or forever hold your peace, right? Well, that's taken away from anybody who has disagreement these days. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to have a disagreement. In fact, I'm gonna cut you off if you do, right? So it's important to note that you are nonetheless witnessing this before God and man. Do you wanna be as if you were a person on their, on their marriage license? Because that's what it's doing in the spiritual realm. Um, I've had some people who've decided to go to the uh, reception, but not the wedding. I think that's a fairly reasonable, if you were gonna go anywhere for a compromise, that might be the place. I don't know that I could do it because I would still be celebrating something that God uh, finds difficult enough that would separate a person from the kingdom of God. And so do I want to give them the sense that it's okay? Um, I do want relationship with a loved one who's gay identified or uh, trans identified. Um, so. You know, that's the hard part. What's your, what are your thoughts on that, David? Well, I, I see the demands to go to the wedding or else as emotional manipulation. A child often knows that how to manipulate the parent, and they're very good at it. And with, with the mother in particular, who has, is more emotional than the father, usually, 
um, this emotional manipulation works really well in many cases. And I've seen over the years, uh, parents with a gay child uh, being persuaded ever so slowly by the child and this emotional manipulation to give in and, and not oppose uh, the lifestyle anymore. And, um, and that's so sad because mm. they are the key witness for the truth for that child. That's right. So, yeah, it's, I think of first Corinthians six, nine through 11, when I think of this situation, um, and do I want to be witness to my child heading down a very dangerous pathway spiritually? Do not be deceived, either adulterers, idolaters, et cetera, et cetera. And homosexuality is one of those entries will not inherit the kingdom of God, but such were some of you. And of course, that points back to our motto. And David, your wonderful documentary, such for some of you of people leaving a gay life in obedience to Christ. And so there is hope. I'll tell you what, a lot of kids who return to Jesus are so grateful for their family member, their, their grandmother, their grandfather, their mother, dad, who never stopped praying for them and believing that God had more um, and, and declaring the truth of God over them, that they are designed for relationship with him. And that is absolutely accurate. Everybody's designed for relationship with Jesus. But what Will they all give in and surrender? That's the big question, right? But what they often say is, uh, how could God create me gay and then condemn me for acting in that way? Um, what do you say to that? Well, first, on a scientific level, um, there's no evidence for that. Um, the twin studies, even with the same exact DNA, had like a 30% correlation between one twin who had identical genes to another. So there's a, a minor amount of 30%-ish amount of uh, genetic influence, which is very, what they call low heritability. I'm getting way over probably everybody's head with these scientific terms. But the point here is that people are not designed to be gay according to scripture uh, either. And so we were born after the fall after the fall of man and disobedience, uh, but we weren't designed with a specific sin in mind as a result of the fall, right? I mean, we were, we're prone to be rebels until we surrender to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And then we're born again into a new, as a new creature who longs to be in alignment with the God of hosts, the one who made us for his own good pleasure. Throughout the entire scripture, there's nowhere where it endorses homosexuality. God never says, oh yeah, that's a good thing. Or in certain cases, that's a good thing. There's no exception clause um, from the beginning of the scripture to the end. It's all about the wedding of, um, you know, at the beginning, a connection of Adam and Eve. But at the end, Christ and the church are the fulfillment of this beautiful imagery of man and woman coming together. That's a look ahead at what is yet to come. And so fouling with that is like drawing on the Mona Lisa. It's, it's uh, you know, taking um, famous artwork and just sketching, putting a two-year-old child in front of it or a dog walking with paws, you know, across it. It's defiling something sacred. Um, we were designed for a male-female connection sexually, uh, but other than that, we're designed for singleness as well. And service to God. That's, there's no harm in that. Paul highly thinks, of, thinks highly of that, but there is no uh, approval or endorsement or there are only negative things said about polyamory, sex before marriage, homosexuality, adultery. Um, those are all dangerous things to get involved with. We're going to have to go, but uh, one last question. What if, uh, say they accept the fact that the Bible uh, D disagrees with homosexual behavior right uh what what can their expectation be of transformation because they're thinking it's not fair that i have this that i'm not attracted to the opposite sex if i accept jesus and enter into counseling and ministry uh will i change will i suddenly be heterosexual or what's that like we have about well, three minutes for that okay that's excellent that's a great question um 
no one is suddenly heterosexual uh, in their desires. I mean, one, we have to separate three things out. One is behavior, another identity, and another desire, right? Did I say those three things? <laughs> Did I get that all out? Behavior, identity, desire. Yes, there we go. Um, and um, the identity, when you come to Jesus, changes immediately as far as being his and becoming, having new, really good, concrete identities. I am a son. I'm a daughter of the king. I am a, um, you know, a friend of Jesus. He calls us a friend of Jesus himself. Um, uh, a whole bunch of other things. I am, you know, the apple of God's eye, what have you. Those beautiful images that God says about the people who surrender, that they celebrate in heaven over someone surrendering to him. Um, but feelings often don't change immediately. Um, there's a relational issue, and usually there are relational solutions to that. And that takes time. It's over a lifetime period of God maneuvering in a person's life and causing them to surrender one thing after another. I like Shrek's comment. I'm like an onion. I have layers. Okay, well, growth in humans comes in layers and over a lifetime. And as you work different muscles spiritually, you grow. Uh, First Peter talks about that. I, you know, there's increasing into the image of Jesus. And so what can they expect, though, as far as their feelings? Uh, behaviors can be surrendered, but feelings can be really difficult, especially at first. Um, well, you know, the more they surrender, the more likely they're going to grow those muscles to obey and obeying, they'll start to see different things about life. Um, so it's almost as if identity changes seemingly first, then secondly, some behavioral changes uh, and growing in Christ likeness and away from sin. And then thirdly, often the feelings begin to resolve over a lifetime. Some people continue to struggle. Now, scientifically speaking, the best information we have right now is about 38% of people after a year of discipleship have had significant change. So they're not struggling in any routine format with homosexual feelings. That's a huge change. That's better that's, than uh, alcoholics and drug addicts. Yeah, it's enormous. And, you know, some people have gone on longer to have that result. Um, there, another, you know, 32% or a little bit more, I think it's, I think it's 40, somewhere in the 40% um, continue to struggle to some degree. And they gain the ground where they no longer have to respond to the struggle by sinning. Um, so the sins no longer, the struggle is no longer in charge of them, but they're in charge of the struggle and how they respond. That's a huge win in my book. Yeah. And then another 16% go back into the gay lifestyle. That's according to one study done by a ministry using living waters material. Yeah. Over and, that could be, and that could be that they didn't get the right help. It could be all kinds of reasons why they give up. And yeah. go, I, I've often noticed that uh, people who are entering this uh, ministry to uh, deal with their homosexual attractions, it's almost like they have a stopwatch on God. And if he doesn't heal them within a certain amount of time, they just leave. And so they're trying and their their image of to healing control God and, and, be, and the time you know, that he brings into that. Okay, God, you got to do the light switch or I'm out of here. Yeah. Um, I was gay, now I'm straight, boom. Uh, they in put my, that condition. That's a dangerous thing to do. In my experience, uh, the Lord had to take me through healing of forgiveness, uh, the lies that I believed that weren't true, my fear of intimacy, my self-hatred. All of these things fed into uh, an arrested emotional development that when they got healed and the emotional development got restarted as a result, then there was a gradual diminishment of the same-sex attractions and a gradual increase of the heterosexual attractions. It amazed me at how practical and real and significant change can be for those who pour themselves into seeking God. Now we're over time. Let me tell the folks here, restoredhopenetwork.org is the place to go. Ann Polk has written a fabulous book called Restoring Sexual Identity. Uh, these are two of the resources. Then we have that film called How Do You Like Me Now, which is on the Restored Hope Network website. 
And if you have a loved one or a friend who needs help in this area, or if you need help in this area, uh, go to Restored Hope Network and they have a whole list of ministries all around the country and they can plug you into the one closest to you. So thanks, Anne, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. What a pleasure to be join you. I'm sorry we went over. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. Remember, much of Dr. Foster's teaching has been taken from his new book entitled Sexual Healing Reference Edition, available at our website, masteringlife.org. This podcast and our many other resources are available because of our donors. If you are one of them, thank you. If you would like to join in supporting us, please visit masteringlife.org. 